this edition of Binder Vision is dedicated to the work of two designer binders. Edgar Mansfield has been described as having had the most profound influence upon bookbinding design since J. Cobden Sanderson. Although no longer active as a craftsman, Edgar was in 1987 invited by collectors Duval and Hamilton to produce a series of designs to be materialized by James Brockman, a professional designer binder of great skill and inventiveness. I, let me see, I was born in London, but um, was taken to New Zealand uh, when I was four. And I didn't leave there again after, uh, until I'd been uh, you know, tra um, educated and um, been uh, teaching for 10 years. And I came over here for further study. But I specialised in, uh, I was trained as a, as a general teacher, but specialised then in art and um, went to art school and so on and uh, taught in the secondary school art. And then came over here to get further study um, in, mainly in crafts, design and crafts, modern design and crafts. When was that? 19, 20, 1934. You've been described, I think quite properly, as the most significant influence on book design since Cobden Sanderson. Were you aware at the time that you were producing a kind of revolutionary approach? I suppose I, um, <laughs> if I wasn't conscious, I was pretty soon made conscious by the resistance of, uh, for example, German bookbinders who saw um, they began reproducing my bindings, everything I did, from about 1948, 49 onwards in their journal. And um, some of them simply said, this is uh, the rape of the book or the destruction of, of everything that um, tradition stands for. But on the other hand, the editor consistently uh, published them because he said, you've got to understand what this is about because this is likely to be the future. So I had support as well as uh, conflict. And at what point are you able to say the tide turned in your favour generally? Because clearly you have been an enormous influence and many people have tried to, if not copy your design, at least have shown themselves to be very strongly influenced by what you've done. Um, well, abroad, pretty soon after the war, because, as I said, the German magazine and Swiss and the Dutch Magnus uh, and uh, a French Swiss magazine too, uh, printed, consistently printed um, my work and um, had their uh, people writing articles about them and I had people come over to the London College of Printing uh, to interview and find out what it was about. But um, I think probably the 1955 when uh, the group of binders who were um, in, in another guild, the guild of uh, Hampstead uh, scribes and binders, decided to break away and asked me if I would be willing to um, be president of a new guild purely of bookbinding they were forming. I think that was the start, really, the fundamental start when uh, we were able to do our own thing. That was the guild, of, con that was the guild, that was of, the guild of contemporary binders. Yes, which later on became uh, the designer bookbinders that we know today. Well, I began by being trained as a painter and sculptor, and that has continued all my life. The drawing, the designing, the... Um, I, um, well, I look upon this not so much as designing as, as picture making, um, just like little melodies um, in, in music. So uh, the crafts, the applying, let me see, I think I was strongly attracted to binding in the end and, and, and um, stopped doing anything else, um, stopped doing any other craft, uh, because I recognised that the flat rectangular surface, two of them hinged, were ideal painting surfaces as it were. They were ideal vehicles 
for my drawings. But you could have found that in, uh, in, on a flat piece of paper. Uh, and I have done and always did. But um, I don't know. I, I, I think I was greatly attracted to books and literature as well, being a New Zealander in particular. Um, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed doing that. And I loved the tool. I loved those, the, the tool and the feel of the tools going into the leather. I could do that all my life. I've been um, fascinated with line all my life. Line has dominated my, um, draw my work. I've been more concerned with drawing, with play of line, rather like the uh, play of uh, violin. Um, I, I relate the two, really, the sound of a single melody, um, like a violin playing, uh, or a flute or a clarinet, something that sings in the same, uh, I relate that to um, the musical, uh, to the line, the rhythm of line itself. In fact, there also, um, the basic uh, design structure is sonata form. In other words, again, it's a musical form starting with a certain movement, developing and doing whatever you like um, that's interesting within, but returning to the original as you finish. Let's see the way in which you would best uh, illustrate this. Yeah. You've got it there fin uh, and there, but within here there are other movements going on and new forms can occur. Same thing in here. That can swing in there. That is related to that, but this, this curve there and there appears here again. Um, uh, this should have better examples. Again, the lines across here. It wouldn't, I wouldn't finish a design like that because I've got that movement there with that movement there. That's a uh, contrary movement uh, or entirely different movement can be absorbed within but it returns to the original statement, top and bottom. And several of your designs uh, show uh, this, this circle in some way. Sometimes it's larger, yes. sometimes it's smaller. What do you see as the significance of that? Well, to b basically, of course, I'm concerned with uh, not straight lines uh, in, in geometry, but with um, life and living movement. So um, they're all uh, based uh, on n nature's growth, if you like, uh, of life. And the circle is, it's the egg, it's the um, sun, it's the uh, living form. It's the basis of the living form. And also, of course, all these type of movements resolve themselves into that as the uh, final absolute, don't they? But it's always within, however, that, that being a circle and different from these, which are all a different movement, that circle is within. I wouldn't have the circle put there because it's uh, different from this and therefore draws attention outside of the total control. It creates a tension which is not part of the... Yes, it, um, you lose the overall control which you must have within, so that the excitement, the strongest elements, must occur somewhere well within, so they hold the design and every part of it together. It's one of the principles that I adhered to, same as the sonata form is another. I would break it, of course, I wouldn't, um, I'm not holding myself to it. It just happens that in all cases I found it's the best answer, best solution to my um, drawing. Is there any sense in which your work reflects uh, Maori designs? I think there has to be because uh, from earliest childhood I saw so much Maori design, same as I saw, um, I had books of um, the Royal Academy Illustrated so that I was torn more or um, lived with the two different points of view, the uh, Maori magic or the Pacific magic and the uh, English 
uh, naturalistic garden type um, way of thinking, of seeing things. After all, um, I think natural. I think the naturalistic painting and so on is all closely related to uh, literature, the you know the humanistic type of literature that England has been so famous for. Now, of course. Uh, although you're no longer practicing as a binder, you are producing designs, and James Brockman is interpreting those. Tell us about that work. Well, uh, Colgan and Colin, you know, um, Colgan, Duval, Colin, Hamilton, uh, collectors, publishers, um, asked, um, they, they had purchased a number of my bindings at different times, and uh, asked me if I, when I came back and they um, met Coglin, uh, came down and met me, I asked if I would um, do this, um, create designs and uh, allow um, James Buckman to carry them out if he was agreeable. It was a great surprise to me really that one day um, Colin Hamilton rang me up and said they would like to come and see me in Oxford. And so Colin and Colgan um, Duval came along and invited me to work with Edgar on this project. Um, I didn't have any reservations. I mean, initially a lot of people thought that really I should just stick to my own designs and work on my own things, but it didn't worry me. I had a trade apprenticeship where I'd worked for six years doing gold tooling. And so during that time I'd worked on traditional work. I'd done lettering of books, a whole range of things which weren't of my own choice. So it wasn't a difficult thing to do. And being as the project was spread out, out over so many years, eight years in all, um, it was easy for me to fit it in around the other things I wanted to do. So I just enjoyed it when I was able to get to it, and then I went on and did my own work at the same time alongside it. I'd now been uh, involved in exhibi exhibiting sculpture for the last um, number of years, and had stopped binding for all practical purposes. And also my sight was going because of this um, what do you call it? You had shingles in, shingles, in the eye. Shingles, yeah. yeah. Yes. It's half blinded, well, practically blinded one eye. Mm. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's all right for drawing. I can draw because I can rub out if I made a mistake. But you can't rub out on binding. Once you tool, that's it. It's, in other words, it's, a, it's absolutely uh, precision and uh, craft with, with no... Um, no mercy. No second chances. There's, yeah, there's no mercy there. It's, you, you make a mistake, it's there forever. So that I, I would have been producing work that was not better than I'd been doing before, which I should have been, but much worse, and that wouldn't do. And how do you feel about seeing your designs being uh, interpreted by somebody else? That's a difficult question to answer. I know exact, I can visualize exactly what the final result's going to be from my design because I'm tooling it as I'm drawing it. And a good craftsman like uh, James will produce that result. But I don't know whether uh, uh, in the actual tooling of it I might have uh, been in, uh, uh, decided to do certain slight differences. There might be slight differences occur. You can tell the difference between one craftsman and another, not to, because one's better than the other, but w by touch, by a difference in their, their touch. It was a great joy to use Edgar's tools. I mean, he'd made them, uh, I understand, all himself, filed them away and, and made all these wonderful curves which fit perfectly together. And it was a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to use them and to sort of be his hands on this project. For most of your life, you've mm. made your own tools, yes. haven't you? Why was that? Uh, because the ones that were available, the commercial ones, were far too thin and um, long. They didn't hold the temperature. And um, they were straight. Gouges and pallets were dead straight, where, in fact, the best way of designing them is to have a slight curve so that you rock the tool in. And uh, the same with the gouge, the same rocking it in from uh, and easing it along. So you have shorter ones easing along to make longer lines um, and it's more economical and uh, it's much more efficient. 
So I reckoned I could make tools better than the uh, tool makers because the tool makers knew all about the making of tools. They didn't know anything about their use. And they wouldn't take any advice from the people who were going to use them because they knew better. So I had to do it myself. And I've been lucky enough to have the whole range of them available to me while, while I've been working on this project. There are literally hundreds of them, and Edgar made these um, himself. He filed them up, I understand, during lunch breaks at the London College of Printing when he was teaching there, um, from blanks. And um, this is the A line, which is the thinnest line of all. And as you can see, they're beautifully made. Um, and each one is numbered. This is number 23, 2. Um, 23 is the diameter of the curve that it fits, and 2 denotes the length of the line. There would be different lengths of line to the same diameter to fit all the curves that were in the drawings and designs. When I used them, I didn't find over all the hundreds or thousands of um, combinations that I had to use that there was ever a time when there weren't two, for two tools that fitted together exactly to the designs that he had drawn. Conventional gouges are very geometrical, aren't they? Oh, yes, I've got about... Um, 30 different, uh, 30 or more different curves from the smallest up and about three lengths of each. So I've got about uh, 100 tools uh, for each thickness of line. Uh, and would you make a, an, an S-shaped gouge? Oh, no, no, you'd link them up because you, with two tools you can do so much. You can do the S but you can do any other curves as well of that diameter. Not much point in just merely having a, a tool that will only do one thing, Ex except, in, of course, in cases like uh, the swell tool, I did make gooses which were thicker and thinner, and I could only use them at once. There were a number of tools I made, like, there's an example now, that, down uh, imagining down the river, that swells from a thin to quite thick, and then thin again there. Um, but I made it in two because it would have been too, too heavy and would have required too much pressure. I, I'd never had the strength to do it. Um, so I had two here uh, overlapping so that I tooled the first one in and then linked up with the second one uh, starting in a bit from where that one ended and following it forward. But that could only be used the once and then scrap that. Blind tooling, it's, a, it's really, um, blind tooling is a bit more difficult than gold because all you've got to do is to make the gold stick. Mind you, <laughs> that's no easy matter, but with, with the training, uh, and um, sooner or later you've got it right. But gold, you see, uh, the trouble with gold is that um, it, um, I was trying to convey some of the meaning, some of the content, or some of the meaning behind the book. And if I use gold, half the time uh, the book is not concerned with anything golden. It's quite, it might be quite ruthless or quite entirely different. Even nature is not golden. And so I'd only use it when it um, suited my purpose. But otherwise, the blind lines of different darkness were the things best used. And of course, um, they are the most permanent, the gold and uh, blind lines are the most permanent technique for a binding. Well, this one is, is one of the most interesting ones because um, it's a skin I wouldn't have chosen initially. If I was going to do this amount of gold tooling on one book, I wouldn't have chosen a skin that was as heavily grained as this. The gold finisher wants a smooth skin on a, on a hard board with very little grain, so you get as good a definition as possible with the tooling. But of course I didn't have a choice. This is a, a Levant skin, heavily grained, and the great thing about Edgar and his choice of materials and the way he works is that the grain and texture is crucial to his, um, to his design philosophy. I like, if I'm using paint or whatever it might be, I like the medium that I'm using to look like that medium really is. I want to get the best out of it, for example. Oil paint is lovely and rich, and so I would want to use the paint richly on, and on the surface. Um, if I'm using watercolour, then it's coloured water, and, um, and I love the flow of liquid coloured water on the paper. 
and if I'm using leather, it's, uh, it's a thick, richly grained leather, uh, especially ones that I would select. And I like to develop the grain, work it up even. You can damp it all over and turn it over and roll it um, inside out. That uh, causes the grain to be enriched. And during the, um, <coughs> during the painting, uh, not using the paste too thick to strain or stretch, but putting it on nicely and evenly. And um, in the covering, you would work the work the leather up a little with your hands as you're as you're working to um, enrich the grain and reduce the tension. You don't pull the leather pull the leather onto the book except tightening it firmly over the spine. There you do need to get a little more pressure, but afterwards you can lift up each side in turn and lower, lower it down again gently, easing it in as you go, and even brushing it with your palm so that um, you bring up the grain even more strongly. So I had to make the best of what I got. So it was a very difficult job to get the precision and to get the sharpness of this gold tooling. It's also um, a good example of how um, the designs changed as they went along because originally I tooled this circle here on the spine in palladium. Now, when Edgar saw that, he thought it drew too much attention to it, so it was changed to gold. So the designs did evolve in the same way as they would have done if he was doing the work himself. When you're handling the leather all the time and the tools, they, they talk back to you. And it isn't, uh, it isn't so much um, in, in any mistakes. It's when the, the tools tell you possibilities. And that opens up for the next design and for future, future possibilities. You discover new possibilities because you are doing the thing yourself. If you are a purely a designer, then like the French uh, or some, uh, you would probably end up by being a technical exhibitionist. Whereas handling the medium yourself, you develop possibilities in the medium which they can't know anything about because they're not handling the thing. They're not getting that feedback from That's the it. medium. They're not getting the feedback. But would you, uh, as the, the tools and the leather were talking to you as you, mm -hmm. as you were working your design, would you then incorporate that a conversation, if you like, um, into the design that you're doing, or would you always religiously, quite conscientiously, stick with the planned design that you've already drawn? Um, there's that uh, through the woods, the British oh, Museum. Oh, that's one, yes. Uh, the uh, textures that were in the leather, um, shall we say, told me to make certain slight changes in order to exploit those textures, getting them in, the, in a particular position. Uh, that means, for example, that in this book, for, um, I cut the leather very carefully uh, to have those in the position they are in relation to the design I'd made. And um, I think I made certain adjustments in the design as well to get the most out of it. I've incorporated the spine into the design so that it in itself um, relates to uh, the angle of a tree or trunk and the others rock with it. You're talking about the spine of the leather? The spine of the leather, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, onto, the, onto the cover at an angle that linked up with the others. Most of the M papers are very plain. Edgar doesn't like leather joints. This one's got a leather joint, which was one of the ones which I just decided to do this. But he really wasn't interested about what I did with the blurs, what I did with fly leaves, um, and what I did with joints, or in fact with end bands. This is one of the, um, the ones which I did a double end band, quite a bright one, um, with a leather joint. But it's the sort of thing that he really wasn't interested in. He wasn't too worried about any of that sort of detail. In fact, he, the plainer the better, as far as he was concerned. I mean, a lot of people say that they think that these come from a certain period, sort of mid-20th century, and I can understand that. I mean, there's, um, 
um, you can see the natural shapes that were very popular um, perhaps in the 50s and 60s. Um, I don't think it's influenced me a great deal. Um, it's stretched me. It's made me do things that I wouldn't do, um, would, would probably have never attempted. I mean, to tour a circle with Googies is something as a finisher I would have always actively avoided um, to do this sort of thing. But it's forced me to do those things, and I've achieved a lot, and I feel, feel a lot of satisfaction from doing it. But I still think that I don't think it's really made me change the way I work. I think it's such a personal statement with design that it would be a major change to change to this and my own work I think evolves very much from structure and the way the book is put together and I like to reflect that in my design. Um, Edgar is not so concerned about structure and in a way that's why the whole project works so easily because um, Edgar would let me do exactly what I wanted with, with sewing, with board attachment, with board makeup, with all the other things. Um, he was only really interested in the cover decoration. Um, so we were coming at it from two completely different angles I think. This is a personal thing because, of course, some people uh, are fascinated more strongly by colour and areas, coloured areas, than by line. Well, that's their business. For me, I'm more fascinated by line, and it's a very, very functional uh, and sound technique for tooling bindings. And it's very expressive. I don't think there's any limit to what you can do with line and... Uh, uh, um, my particular uh, fascination is with the thinking of line as uh, a song without words um, or a melody. Um, you, you know, I mean, a, a, para, a parallel with, with music, a parallel with um, Beethoven's uh, violin concerto. So I'm, I'm not comparing, of course, but I mean uh, that kind of attitude towards line, singing line. I used that, for example, on the Little Flowers of St. Francis. Uh, it was simply covered with a series of, little, uh, of different units of line all linking you know, together with one another, like um, the this, this series of stories that the book contains being compared to Little Flowers, the title of Little Flowers of St. Francis. Um, I, instead of repeating that analogy, um, I used um, uh, lines, little lines, which were like little songs, say St. Francis um, preaching to the birds or the birds preaching back to St. Francis, songs. This piece of line here, for instance, um, the number of tools needed would be one here, perhaps two to there, three, another one bringing it into the straight piece here, four, five, six, seven, tightening up there, eight, straight here, nine, round the curve, ten, a little bit of a change in direction there, not ten, eleven, straight here, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen down to here, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, perhaps twenty-two tools needed to complete that piece of line. These are drawings take on a very thin paper which is taken from the original design. Um, they have these cutouts which are to hold them in place when they're put onto the book. Little pieces of tape are put on and stuck to the leather. Care is taken of course to make sure the adhesive won't pull the grain off the leather. So it's held down very firmly and this is the exact size of the board area. The tools have all been marked on here, so you can see where they stop and the number of the tool. Um, 23-1 here, which will be used to go from this stroke here to here, um, then on to 17-1, which takes us around this curve. The curve tightens up, so 14-2, which is of course a smaller diameter, 17 to 14, flattens out here into 23-1, tightens up again 17-1, flattens out again a little bit there, 21-1, Tightens up a lot here into 9.3 and then back here into where it's flattening out again into 14.2. So just to get around that circle takes all those tools. This is really just an example of how I went about tooling um, this book. What I use is a rotary pen with some BS glare in it. This is a shellac base glare. 
um, and I use a 0.6 millimeter rotaring pen. The glare can be put on in a very controlled way with the pen by just going around the blind impression and also means you don't get a lot of fuzz and problems with the gold sticking beyond the impression which is, which is crucial. Um, the gold leaf comes in these books of 25 sheets and is just taken out and laid onto the gold cushion and then to flatten it out. One twenty-five thousandth of an inch thick, I seem to recall, yeah. is the size of the thickness of that, isn't it? That's right. If you hold it up to the light, you can see through it. Well, that's why um, on all of this tooling, I've probably got about eight or even more layers of gold. So I've cut it into small pieces. Now I'm going to take a tool off of the stove, quench it on the, on the cooling pad, and polish it. It's, a, it's most important that the face of the tool should be as shiny as possible. That will give you a shiny um, gold tooling. Then a little bit of grease from the back of the ear onto the face of the tool, and then the gold can be picked up on the tool and brought across, blown under with a puff and struck into the, t into the line. In the case of gold, you merely button the grain. In other words, it's very much near to the surface. But in the case of a blind tooling, it's very nice to press in more firmly and give a feeling of, uh, of depth and richness, uh, of volume to the surface. But um, the, the, the thing is that practice, this is where practice is so terribly important. Um, constantly tooling, 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 uh, you end up with um, or coming off the same angle every time. But that only comes as a result of practice. You mightn't do it first time or the hundredth time, but by the time you've tooled enough, your tool always comes off at the same angle every time. Thus, it creates um, the surface, reflecting surface, that is the same at the bottom of every letter. And so you don't get dull, dull and bright, but you get an even uh, glint. This is same thing applies in the case of an all-over pattern that you might be tooling. You might be tooling a repeat all over, or a mass of little dots, as here. Um, you never move, but you tool constantly all the time at the same angle, and you get the same surface then. But if you turn it around, and the same thing with repeat, designs such as the traditional ones. Always the uh, craftsman would retain the book at the same position and come in at the same position. Then he gets an even glint right throughout the book. This is a red native dyed skin, the kind that Edgar loves. Very uneven toning. Um, and this skin was chosen especially because of the very dark spine which was chosen to match up with this gold tooled line running through the center of the backboard over the spine and onto the front and to the center point here which is a yellow inlay which has just been very slightly burnished with gold leaf on the surface. The tooling then all emits from this point and takes the form of um, bird shapes and fish shapes. This circle here was um, particularly interesting because this was a, one of the circles that Edgar said wasn't absolutely round. He, when he tooled these sort of things himself, he would have tooled this with one of his gouges, fitting it together to form the circle. I was a little nervous about doing this, so I approached this in a different way and made up the circle on my lathe and then tooled it. So it was a tool that I made especially for this book. When I showed the book to Edgar, Edgar said, well, that circle doesn't look quite round to me. And I said, well, I can assure you, Edgar, that it is round because it's a tool I've made on my lathe. He said, well, sometimes a circle has to be a little out of round to look round. <laughs> we are surrounded by various of your, mm. your bronzes. Again, we do see that here you've been really fascinated by line. Mm. They're utterly linear, aren't they? They are utterly linear. Uh, the surfaces are uh, simply the lines, the edges, uh, linked by surfaces. Their nearest relationship would be to seashells, yes.
they're not volumes. There's no thick. There's no thick weight of volume contrasting with um, hollows. It's all hollows of varying uh, widths and depths and so on, uh, linking up line edges of rhythm, of play of line. Some of your sculptures are uh, sculptures are, are vertical. Some of them are really sort of horizontal designs, mm -hmm. and some seem to be really very compact. Yeah. Uh, again, is there a sort of a conscious uh, preference for one or the other of these forms? I don't think so. They come uh, as the result. They they just merely grow out of nothing. Is <laughs> really out of the imagination and. Um, take on one form or another form. I think probably the reaching upward it would be more uh, more typical, same as with my designs, because they're reaching up to the sun in a way. I adore the sun and, and, and life, and life all grows up towards the sun rather than along horizontally. But I do like, nevertheless, horizontal rhythms, naturally. Edgar, can you give me an example of the sort of thing you mean when you're talking about the the, the way in which very complex um, gobbledygook could be expressed simply in art terms? Yes, I could. Um, you, you'll know perhaps of um, Picasso's Crying Woman, which um, has been so attacked because it's a woman with um, claws staring at her face and the head split open and so on. Now. It's criticised because it isn't a nice, neat picture of grief, uh, but um, painting a model posing at so much an hour um, with the face of grief and then stopping every so often for a cigarette and so on. He, instead, Picasso is painting the inner reality and truth of grief as felt from inside. You've got to understand the difference between the points of view in order to understand the picture and understand, for example, Picasso. It is the woman's grief seen from inside, not posed by a model from outside, which has got nothing to do with grief at all. You were talking about the sort of snobbery in art. Can you enlarge on that a little more? Yes. There is uh, some um, misunderstanding, mix-up, or it's, it's really uh, rooted in tradition, I suppose, the concept that uh, if it's art, it shouldn't it shouldn't be functional. You shouldn't be able to use it. So even if you uh, take a, a, a lavatory and tear it off the wall and stick it onto uh, a piece of board, you can sell it to the Tate Gallery as art. But um, otherwise, of course. Um, the idea of it being art is ridiculous. And you say, uh, and you get a hundred uh, bricks yeah. and laid down. Art. Well, it, just because you're not using them, uh, that doesn't make them art. And are you saying, therefore, that uh, the book bindings, book designs, are not accepted as art because you can actually use the book and read That's it? That's it. Has a, That's it. The moment you, if if you were to take the book and um, paste all the pages together. And then stick it on the uh, stick it on a wall um, with a frame around it. You could sell it as art. In, in fact, the Tate Gallery has and has had for oh, 30 or 40 years, I suppose, um, one panel containing five, I think, books spread open and set fire to, so they're all burnt, and that is accepted as art. Well, of course, this is shit. Whereas um, an, uh, quite a lot of bindings I know from a number of bookbinders in the Guild or in the Society DB um, are producing fine bindings that are in themselves better artworks, better design, better uh, covers than a large number of paintings that are being bought today. This is the, the Shelley, which um, has got these large um, inlaid areas. This is um, 
Another skin, which again, um, if you saw this skin on a binding, you'd almost immediately say yes, Edgar Mansfield, because it's a skin he loved to use and the colour he loved to use. With this um, native dyed yellow, um, because of the problems in covering, um, what I did was to keep it as dry as possible when I covered it. Um, this avoids spotting, the black spotting and staining. Um, and equally, we have the same problem with the, the natural. And in fact, these natural inlays on the front and back were put in um, two or three times, I think, um, before I was satisfied with them. Um, the method of doing inlay is to cut away with a scalpel the, um, the covering leather. And I've got an example here of the actual leather that was used for this one. And what is done is that the, the design is placed onto the book and marked around through the paper to the shape. And then the shape is then cut out with a scalpel. This is one of Edgar's own scalpels that he made. It's got a very short blade, so it's very controllable. And it's got a bevel on both sides. So it's very easy to, to use and to control. Edgar's um, scalpel is used freehand to cut around the mark and cut into the covering leather, and then is then peeled out. Once the, pe once the piece that's coming out has been taken out, it is mic'd up with a little micrometer. A micrometer is used to test the thickness of the leather needed for the inlay. And so the piece that is removed from the cover is mic'd up and then a piece of leather is paired to the same thickness as the piece that came out and then stuck onto a piece of card which is lined with a strong craft paper. Um, the design is then put onto there and marked around with a sharp folder and then the scalpel is then used again to cut around freehand at an angle so that the um, inlay leather can be peeled out and then used into the cover. This, it then takes a lot of fitting, a lot of care is needed just to make minor adjustments to make sure that the, the join is as good as possible so that it is a nice, even, snug fit. And so it's quite a tricky with a large inlay like this to get it absolutely right. Does pressing the book uh, help at that stage, or is it well, a question really of the thickness of the leather and getting it absolutely right? Well, it, it has to be, um, I say absolutely right, I mean, because the thing with Edgar is that if there are slight variations, it's not a problem. I mean, that's part of the way he worked, to have variations. But to press it would be the normal solution to the problem. But as none of these books have been heavily pressed, because we want to keep as much of the grain as possible, and the way that Edgar works is to have the tools, for instance, biting into the leather, so you get this nice soft edge to the leather when the tool bites in. If you did that on a heavily pressed leather, you wouldn't get that effect. It would look much more mechanical. These have a much more natural um, look to them. And so it, it isn't, so the, the inlays have to be fitted very accurately rather than being put in fairly casually and then pressed. We, we couldn't get away with that, and we don't normally do that way anyway. This I don't like is the use of areas of thin onlay and also the crushing of the leather so that its, its textural quality is destroyed and it might just as well be uh, a piece of um, printed plastic. Now, when that happens, that's, that's a typical West End style, or was, uh, that I object to. The backboard of this book is almost a repeat of the front. Um, but not quite. Unfortunately, it was not exactly the same. If the tooling pattern had been identical, I would have just been able to reverse it to do a mirror image, but it wasn't. Um, so all these lines had to be reworked out for the new tooling pattern. So we've got, although they took, look very similar, there are very subtle differences. Um, so each one had to be worked out individually, so there's a tremendous amount of work in this. After, there's two thicknesses of line, the A line and the B line. And after um, blinding in and then sharpening the line again by tooling direct. It was then gone over with a, a rotaring pen with a black ink, a black Indian ink. Um, and the line then, after the ink was dry, was burnished with a folder, just to, to, to give some a shine to the ink. Nearly all the designs of yours which I've seen lettered, you've, you've used a sans serif uh, yes. letter. Why is that? Because uh, all my um, all the rest of the design is in even even strokes uh, in palettes and gouges of even thickness and um, 
serifs don't make a lot of sense. They're not logical in relation to that. Furthermore, uh, serifs are, uh, they, they, the fine endings of serifs, uh, it's too small, it's out of scale with the uh, texture of the leather. Remember, I didn't, I didn't have a polished leathers. Uh, when the, um, when the ser serif lettering was originally used, uh, the kind of decoration was also similar in little filigrees and thin lines and so on, and there was a harmony between <coughs> the serif. Furthermore, the leathers were used thinner and were highly polished with the polishing iron, bringing the surface of the leather very smooth, so that then impressing the serif letter in was uh, well, quite satisfactory. And what about um, uh, upper and lower case? Again, you seem to have used capitals nearly all yes, the way through. Yes, well, um, lower case is designed for um, a mass of text, whereas capitals are designed for display lines and uh, for inscriptions, for example. Uh, they create straight, clean um, decoration, straight, clean lines, whereas a lower case uh, throw up and down uh, lines at random, thin lines at random, and not under the designer's control, so that they just merely irritate the space around those little bits sticking up and down. And also they contain small, much smaller um, counters, that is the, the enclosed spaces inside, than the capitals do. And that, it, that drags the leather down. That's inappropriate to tooling, to have very small uh, counters, very small uh, spaces. How do you feel uh, now about, uh, in the book binding uh, area particularly, but perhaps it's mm -hmm. also true of sculpture, that in fact uh, pieces that of your own work will change hands at uh, a contemporary sort of uh, sale room prices, which would probably astonish you mm -hmm. and certainly doesn't reflect the original price for which you sold them. Well, I'm rather pleased that people um, uh, begin to value them more highly than they did before, that's all. Good on them. Oh, I'm not fussy about that. <laughs> Thank goodness for, um, for collectors and for sales because it makes them um, more demand, doesn't it? That helps us to live. You are to some degree, I suppose, uh, unique among some uh, uh, creative people who you're, you're living to see the full appreciation of some of your work. Well, I, I'm not seeing all that much yet for the drawings. So, um, I hope they will be um, liked and seen more. But um, there's nothing I can do about it. Your bindery um, in New Zealand, I understand, is just is still there. You yes. you uh, you obviously oh, yes, are not it's using it now, but yeah, it's yes. still there. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel that that is uh, likely to be uh, sort of retained as a kind of shrine to uh, <laughs> New Zealand's uh, most famous uh, binding and designing son? God, I'd have to be pretty conceited to think that. <laughs> yeah. But what do you think will happen to your bindery? Oh, somebody will use it as a garage. When one day when it's when it's uh, when I'm dead and it's been sold. But do you think that uh, the uh, the Arts Council, for example, in New Zealand, might uh, take it lock, stock, and barrel and, and recreate it somewhere as being the place in which you? No, good heavens, no, I don't think so. It might uh, might take some of the um, uh, models that um, from which the. Uh, sculptures have been cast, but um, no, I don't think anything like that's likely to happen. Edgar Mansfield, thank you very much. My pleasure. James Brockman's bindery near Oxford is the setting for a very diverse range of work. In addition to fine binding commissions, the restoration of important antiquarian books occupies increasing amounts of James's time. 
James Brockman is noted for his inventive and innovative approach to the structure of books. Recently, he has astonished the bookbinding world by developing books with concave spines. How did that come about? It was a result of um, some work I did many, many years ago, probably 15, 17 years ago, um, when I started experimenting with book structure and incorporating metals and plastics in structure. And I, in fact, did two electronic bindings in the late 70s. Um, these incorporated a double hinge on each cover. So I'd gone from a normal two-hinge book, which was my uh, traditional bindings, if you like, um, into a double hinge. And it always seemed very strange to go to make things more complicated, to go from two hinges, two joints on a book, to four to make the thing work. So then I thought I'd turn that around. And so then I started working on single hinge. All the single hinge bindings I did involved metals. And they worked OK, but I've always had this concern about moving away from non-binding materials. And so I wanted to make um, bindings which other binders could do if they enjoyed experimenting as I did and, and working with these new structures. And so that, the single hinge, automatically made the spine come, become um, concave. And so it was really just an extension of that. And so what I've got here, I've got a concave spine, which is a um, natural progression from my single hinge bindings, where a tube will be located into this concave shape. Um, but in fact, I've gone back to the two hinges. So I've done a sort of complete circuit, but to get back to two hinges again, two joints. But on the way, I've discovered that it's possible to have a concave spine. So I discovered it almost by accident. But then it suddenly occurred to me that Every book I've ever seen, um, unless it's been forced into a round and it's been backed heavily and it's been lined heavily, it always wants to become concave. And so I've noticed, since, since this has dawned on me, that as I take a book off a sewing frame after sewing, it often naturally becomes concave. And certainly paperbacks, telephone directories, all those sort of things which aren't backed, they all become concave with use. And so I started experimenting more with that and thinking about it. And I produced um, six prototypes before I produced the, um, the fine binding on the Dove's Bindery book. Um, and each of them, I tried to make the spine as rigid as possible, but in the concave shape, and to use only book binding materials. You just use leather and card and board and paper and linen and thread and so on. Um, no metals involved. Um, and so this is where I'm at now. Um, this is my first concave spine binding using normal bookbinding materials. This has got a transparent, ve transparent vellum spine over red goat skin boards. The spine is of a fixed tight back type and the headbands and the caps are formed into the concave shape. It is essential with this structure that the spine is absolutely rigid and therefore the spine has somewhere in the region of eight or nine linings of paper before the covering material is put on. The inside of the binding, for the doubleurs and the fly leaves, I've used a Cobb and Sanderson marble paper. This is one sheet of marble paper that I had that was left over from the kind of marble paper that Cobb and Sanderson used at the Dove's bindery. There's a green leather joint along the inside incorporated with the end paper structure. This method of binding incorporates a split board, so when the board opens, it hinges from the inside back edge rather than a traditional structure, which hinges from the outside top edge of the board. There's a raised support yap edge that goes right around the board. And this supports the text block when the book is standing. And when the book is standing, the text block can't sag because it's locked in to that yap edge. And because the spine here is absolutely rigid with many, many linings, probably six or seven linings of a strong craft paper, that it, it can't flex. So the support on these outside leaves and end papers is transmitted back through here into the spine. And the rigid spine then stops that, the center of the text block from dropping. So this book should be able to stand on a shelf quite comfortably for many, many years and never sag in the center. What are the particular problems created by the shape of the book in terms of lettering and uh, titling? Well, it's, it's been very interesting, this, because I was trained as a finisher, so I was very aware of this potential problem uh, right from the beginning. Um, but of course, the type holder 
and the methods we use for tooling books uh, has evolved because of the book structure as we know it, the rounded spine. Um, so I don't see that as being a major problem. We're, the reason we're locked into the way we do things is because the book is accepted as being the shape it is. So if the book had always been this shape, we would have had a different set of tools available to us. Um, but what I've tried to do with these books is to tool them in, to show that it can be done. So this pattern line here, for instance, at the top and bottom of the spine, is done with a very small pattern roll, which, go, which I just went over. This centre tool, which I thought would be quite amusing to put a centre tool into a concave spine, is in fact two, as the same tool used twice, two impressions. So it's half is done on this side and then turn around and half done on the other side. So it's solving that problem. Um, equally with this one, I've done a gold line, top and bottom. Um, this is done with a small piece of line, which is repeated. Um, it could be possibly done in the same way as this one, of using a small wheel um, to go across. The lettering here is using individual letters, hand letters. And I appreciate that in a production situation, that wouldn't be um, feasible. So, of course, it's possible to use a label, as I did on the first prototype, um, and, and just obviously prepare that off the book and then stick it on, whatever it might be, paper or leather. Um, this is the quarter leather box for the um, concave spine binding. And what I've done here is to put on a black leather onlay piece onto a concave spine on the box. And this demonstrates the distance from this point here in the round and this piece here into the concave part, the distance that the average book would move that was this, of these proportions. Of course, traditionally, um, tooling with a type holder has evolved because the spine was um, convex. So it's, with a type holder, this can be tooled quite easily. When it comes to tooling a concave spine, it's not so easy. This is done with hand letters, and so each letter is put in individually. And I think perhaps if bindings for the last thousand years or more had been concave, then a different method of tooling the concave spine would have been. During the development of this, which I did over many, many months and, and tried lots of different um, techniques on it, I showed it to a lot of people and was constantly waiting for someone to say, well, the reason it's never been done before is. But no one ever came up with this, um, this problem. Um, so what I've done is I, to try and research it as much as possible, I've gone on and I've made the simplest possible version I could think of, which is a case binding, which has a tight back. Um, and really, it's simply sewn on tapes and cased in um, with a linen support here uh, without the the yap support edge, just a simple case binding. But being as the spine has got lots of linings on it here, um, it is very rigid and very stable. So again, there's no tendency for that to drop. And then after that one, I decided to do one on cords just to see how that worked. And this is the corded version, which um, is sewn on uh, five single raise cords, which are laced into the boards. Um, and again, this one has the yap support edge around it. Are there limits to the thickness of the book that will accept this uh, style of binding? I think probably there's limits to the thinness of the book that will accept this style of binding. As far as the thickness is concerned, I think probably the thicker you go, the better, um, because um, the thicker you go, the greater the arc will be, and the greater it will, will open. I mean, if you go down to very thin books, then you haven't got a lot of weight in the text block. Um, and you haven't necessarily got the same problems you would have with a heavier book. So I think it's a solution for heavy text blocks and books that have a lot of use. Um, I'm not suggesting that it's just a method for fine binding. In fact, almost the opposite, really. It's more a, a method that would be good for general book production. Now, I know you shouldn't do it, but people do remove books from a shelf by pulling on the end cap at the, mm. top, the head of the spine. What is the relative strength of the end cap in this case? Well, in fact, it's much, it's much stronger. That's, it's almost like a bonus, in fact, because um, if you pull here, then for the head cap and the end band to move, it's actually got to flatten out. If you think of pulling in this way, it has to flatten out. And being as it's connected to this rigid spine and locked up against the boards, it cannot move. So therefore, it does, in fact, make a much stronger um, head cap, and the whole area is much stronger. Can we for a moment just go back to the case binding? Did you uh, case that in with glue or with paste? Um, what I did was to glue the spine on solid with, um, with glue, um, first of all, and then I pasted down 
the covers in the shut position uh, with paste. And where do you see your development work going now, James? Uh, are there other steps that you now want to work through? Well, it's strange because I sort of feel that after these experiments and after the first fine binding I've done that um, I've got almost as far with it as I can. I, I don't think I can think of many other ways of improving it. I think that, um, I mean, I will do other bindings like this, obviously, and I will experiment, and other people are, are very interested in it, so they will experiment. But um, I think that possibly there may be a little bit of refinement with the joint area, um, but the idea of doing the prototypes really was to solve those problems, and I think I've probably got as far as I can with it. Um, it doesn't produce an indestructible book insofar as um, the joints will still go in the same way as a normal book would. Um, whereas my single hinge metal bindings, I mean, they really are indestructible because it's just a metal hinge. Um, but this is a method that is accessible to everyone who is used to, to, doing, to binding. And in fact, it avoids some of the more complex operations of rounding and backing. Um, and produces, um, as you can see when it opens, a spine that just doesn't move. And the philosophy is, if it doesn't move, it doesn't break. Well, I think there are very few binders uh, who can truly be said to have contributed in such a revolutionary way to the, the shape and the design and the future of the book. It'll be interesting to see where it goes from here in commercial terms. James Brockman, thank you very much indeed for uh, sharing with us today your work with uh, Edgar Mansfield's designs and particularly this uh, new development on the concave book block. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.